Hello, this is the next video in a playlist that I'm calling Hypothesis Testing. And we're in part seven of a little mini series within that larger playlist. Here we're looking at two sided, uniformly most powerful tests in the one parameter exponential family. <clears throat> now, a must watch is part one, where we discuss the theorem on why these two sided tests are uniformly most powerful. And it's really, it's actually a pretty cool extension of the Neyman Pearson limit. But in this example, we're going to look at the Poisson distribution or the Poisson setting. We're going to let our data be Poisson distributed with a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda. We're going to take a sample size n. Our parameter lives in the parameter space omega, which is from zero to infinity. <clears throat> this is the density or the probably mass function. You can technically say density of the discrete type, but really we should say probably mass function. Um, and this is it. So x goes from uh, 0 to infinity. You can rewrite it in this form, which is easier to see that it is part of the exponential family. The uh, lambda, or the uh, natural log of lambda is what we call q. And according to the theorem, this has to be strictly increasing in the parameter, and it, and it is. Our test statistic is the sum of those values. Now the null hypothesis is that the lambda is less than or equal to some value lambda 1, or it could be greater than or equal to some value lambda 2. The alternative is that it's in between those values, and this is an alpha level test. And as mentioned earlier, this is really just an extension of the Neyman Pearson limit. The, and by that extension, this is the uniformly most powerful test for this two-sided test is this. So our test function is phi. It's, it's, it equals 1, which means you reject the null, hypo the null hypothesis with probability 1 if our test statistic is between two critical values, C1 and C2. We, it takes on the value gamma 1, which means you reject the null hypothesis hypothesis with probability gamma 1 if our test statistic equals C1. We reject the null with probability gamma 2 if our test statistic is equal to C2. And we do not reject the null hypothesis if our test statistic is less, strictly less than C1 or greater than C2. The, in here, to determine C1, C2, gamma 1, and gamma 2, there are two side conditions that have to be met. And that's actually part of the extension of the name of Pearson limit. Name of Pearson has one side condition that the expected value of the test function or the null hypothesis has to equal alpha. Here there's two. So it's the expected value of the test function assuming say lambda 1 is true and we get those from here. Put lambda 1. I say lambda i but there's so it's lambda 1 or lambda 2. So lambda Expected value of the test function, assuming lambda 1 is true, is alpha. <clears throat> and the expected value of the test function, assuming lambda 2 is the true parameter, that has to equal alpha. And as a reminder, to, to take the expected value of a discrete variable, it's 0 times this probability of happening, so that's 0. It's gamma 2 times the probability of it happening. Gamma 1 times the probability of it happening, of observing gamma 1, and 1 times this probability, which is here. Now, as a reminder, our test statistic, the sum of the x's, also follows a Poisson distribution with parameter n lambda. Now, what we do here, solving for C1, C2, gamma 1, gamma 2 by hand, is actually extremely tough. Um, I wouldn't say impossible, but something that you really wouldn't want to do by hand. <laughs> um, so what we do is we use R, and R can solve this in a split second, less than a second. So what we do is we smartly choose combinations for C1 and C2. I say smartly choose because in the binomial setting, in, in part 5, we could look at all possible C1, C2 combinations, right? Because the values are, you know, finite. 
But here, the space goes from zero to infinity. So we can't look at all possible values. So we have to do it in a very smart way, which we'll talk about in a second. So, there, there, so there's a list of all possible C1 and C2s, and then we check to see if these are, uh, if this condition can be met that it equals alpha. And if both of them equal alpha, then we're done because it's a unique solution in this setting. Now, um, if we assume we know C1 and C2, then this is a constant. This is a constant. This is a constant. The gammas aren't. So, in when I turn the page. We're going to, for the first equation, we're just going to call this P1, P2, P3. And for the second equation, we'll call it P4, P5, P6. So that's what you're going to see on this page. So when we solve for gamma 1 and gamma 2, we're assuming that the C1 and C2s are known. Then those two side conditions become this, right? This is the probability of being between C1 and C2, given that lambda 1 is a true value. And this is the same, but assuming lambda 2 is a true value. Well, given this equation, you know, we can solve for these two unknowns. So from equation 1, we can solve for gamma 1, plug it into equation 2, and solve for gamma 2, and then plug that back into this equation and solve for gamma 1, and we do. And so these are the uh, values, oop, gamma 1 and gamma 2, that force these equations to equal alpha. But the big note is when, so when you check these equations to see if they equal alpha, every one of them will equal alpha, right? Because we just solved the possible values, you know, the gamma one and gamma two that force those to be alpha. But the thing you have to realize is that gamma one and gamma two are values that our test function can take on. And the and phi can only take on values 0 and 1. So if gamma 1 or gamma 2 is outside that range, and pretty much all of them will be except for one set, then you get rid of them, right? And you keep the, the gamma 1 and gamma 2 that are between 0 and 1. So the test function is between 0 and 1, so we remove any gammas outside that, and then boom, we have a unique solution. Now, again, it's hard to find C1 and C2 by hand. It's easy in R. And we check most likely combinations of C1 and C2. And so what I do in the next video is if, if we assume lambda 1 is the true value, we would expect certain values for that test function, or I mean our test statistic. And then if lambda 2 is the true value, you know, then we would expect certain values for our test statistic. And so we, you know, so we take those average values in both situations and then we generate possible C1 and C2s based upon those likely values. So we, we generate all combinations or you know we smartly generate most combinations of C1 and C2 that could work. And this will be illustrated in the next video. So hopefully you enjoyed this. I sure did. Please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks. Bye.